Hello, everyone, and welcome to Make It Mindful, the podcast where we explore how to keep schools relevant by looking through the lens of mindfulness and asking the question, what's really worth paying attention to here? My name is Seth Fleischauer. I am your host, and I will delve into the world of education by interviewing change makers and focusing on practical, transformative solutions for teaching. Today's guest is Danelle Almaraz. Thank you so much for being here, Danelle. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I am too. You're one of these people that I've met and I've talked to. And while I'm talking to you, and maybe this is just like my own like podcaster brain, I'm like, ah, man, I wish I'd hit record uh, <laughs> because <laughs> the conversations that we've had have been so fruitful and mm -hmm. insightful and stimulating. So I am very excited to have you on today and I appreciate your time. I'm hoping that you could quickly just introduce yourself for people. Hi, I'm Danelle Almarez and I am a chief impact officer for Innovate Ed. I've been doing work in the area of continuous improvement for about 10 years, and I love what I do. Wow. Chief Improvement Officer, great title. Continuous improvement is a, a mindset that I myself subscribe to, easier said than done sometimes, but you are in a, a safe space here to discuss such things. So let's dive into it. In one of those conversations that, that we've had, you said that when it comes to working with schools, the challenges are the same everywhere you go. I'd love to hear your insight about what those challenges are. As I travel around the world and meet with teachers, educational leaders, district offices, their pain points they see are at the, like the GPS level, but from the Google Maps 30,000 foot view, the problem is really the same. They manifest themselves different in every school site and district, but one of the big ones is just the teacher leader pipeline. We talk a lot about there's not enough teachers, we got a teacher shortage. What they don't talk about a lot is the leader shortage. The shortage of teachers wanting to become principals, wanting to become district office folks, or even young people going to school to become educators. Mm. So that is the, the big one of the biggest. I'd say second is probably student empowerment. A lot of people are calling it student engagement, but in that phrase, it makes the teacher more the center. I really want to talk about like student empowerment. I want kids to want to come to school. I want them to be curious. I want them to want to learn. So that's another big one. Um, they're telling us by 26% of students are at a chronic absentee rate across the United States. So one in four kids is not coming to school 18 days out of the year. That's a huge problem. And then being future ready. How do we handle things like AI coming on board, change in instructional design? So those would be the three big buckets that I see everywhere that are the some of the big challenges. Now funding will add to that list. Hmm. Gosh, yeah. Okay, there's an hour and a half of, of material there. I wanna zoom in on future ready, right? What are you hearing from teachers, principals that gives you the impression that being future ready is a concern? And I, I ask this because when I talk to people, it seems like people who are outside the system talk a lot about future readiness. And it seems like something that's such a great idea. Like it's in theory, it, it is very clear and simple. Yes, of course, we should be preparing our students for the future. Yet it also is rooted in this idea that you can even predict what the future is going to be like. And then when the rubber meets the road, there's a lot of actually, we're just trying to reach the standards that we've been told to teach, at, regardless of whether or not we think the future is going to be this way or that way. But I'm wondering, what are you seeing when you go to schools mm. that, that, that gives you the impression that this is a major concern? Mm. I'd say first and foremost, it's they see the need for doing something different. They see that the students are, they're using ChatGPT and they're bringing in papers they supposedly wrote. But what I'd rather them do is really sit down and define clarity of focus is number one, right? Let's define what future ready means. Because I think you just hit the nail on the head to say, I don't think we're even clear of what those competencies, we want kids to be able to collaborate. We really want them to be curious. We want them to be leaders, but the instructional design and the mandates we impose are not a nurturing environment for kids to have those skills, 
right? A very top-down gradual release lesson isn't going to promote curiosity, creativity, collaboration. So the first step when I come in to help is let's clearly define what do we mean by future ready skills. Let's all be on, let's calibrate. What does that mean to you, Seth? What does that mean to, to me? What do I see in my own children and students? But that's where you really have to have teachers there to, to help describe what they think that means. And so I think that's fantastic, that clarity of focus. That's that's a huge thing. We've talked about it, you and I, as that, that being a, a major focus of your work. You also talked about this need for students and, sorry, you also talked about this need that schools have to do something different, almost like a, an intuitive sense that they need to do something different. And I imagine that comes from a general frustration of the state of education. And you look at things that 26% ab chronic absenteeism, you see the, the issues with the teacher leader pipeline, you see all of these things that are just like kind of crushing down the weight of it, crushing down on the education industry. And no wonder they feel like they need something different. But I wonder how you square that with your clarity of focus, right? So mm -hmm. once you've established something, how do you get them <laughs> to not feel compelled to want to change the thing that they're already changing? Like, how do you get them to escape that cycle of needing something different by focusing on the thing that they've decided they want to improve? Mm. So we, we look at a lot of data, surveys, teacher interviews, student interviews, and once we really dig down into, we would call it a problem of practice. What problem of practice would you like to attack? Now that we have clarity of focus, the second step is shared leadership. Are we all on board with what we think we need to do in order to try something different? Doing the same things is going to get the same results. So we can look at data and then say, okay, we made no, we didn't make any agreements of trying anything different. So we can expect the same result again for the next six to eight weeks. But if we can get them to really say, here's what we'd like to try. I think the first step is getting them to trust and empower them. They've been, it's been a top down system for so long. It's almost like kids. All of a sudden, if you say, what do you want to learn about? They're a little <laughs> dumbfounded. It's yeah, been top yeah. down for, and they get frustrated. Oh, what should I do now? I finished my work. Those are <laughs> systems that have been created over a long period of time. So when all of a sudden I tell teachers, you, you have the power now to decide what do you want to work on for the next six to eight weeks? And how are we going to know if it had impact or not? Hmm. They're a little, Danelle, just tell us what to do. Just tell us what we, <laughs> and I said, no, the point is you have to have buy-in now because what happens is once they have buy-in, then they can't blame anyone when it doesn't go well because <laughs> they came up with the plan. Yeah, And it's okay if in the six to eight weeks, we, it's a train wreck. And sometimes it is, it didn't go well, but you learn from it. We're so afraid to try something different because it might not go well. As a teacher, middle school math teacher for 20 years, sixth period always got a better lesson. Because <laughs> I learned along the way that didn't go well, right? Or they didn't understand this problem. And we, we have to get away from this top-down hierarchical system into continuous improvement cycles to let teachers show us there are no experts at the moment. No one is rocking it. No one is, oh, Danelle, we don't need help. We're doing great. Everyone is struggling with how do we do, how can we be better? And until we loosen the reins a little on the system, and we let teachers try some of these things, that's how you build collective e efficacy is letting them um, try something and getting them to believe that they can make change. That's interesting because, so you're talking about this relationship between empowerment and accountability. And I really love mm -hmm. that, right? This idea that in order to make people truly accountable for what they're doing, they have to be <laughs> accountable. <laughs> Right. From start to finish. And you're talking about words like buy in and trust. These are things that I think are easily understood and very, diff very difficult to implement. I I'd love to hear your perspective on how you build trust with teachers, how you get their buy in, how you get that teacher in the back of the room who is comes to PD and is no way I'm going to be grading papers this entire time. These people can't tell me what to do. I've been here for 25 years, like th those types of people and, and really anyone, right? Like, how do you build trust? How do you get buy in? 
Mm-hmm. Um, I, I explain to them my role. My role is just a thought partner. I have no power. I'm just there as a thought partner to help and to try and build some feedback loops amongst the teachers, the, the site staff and the district to find out what's working, what's not. Um, so often when they realize that the district has sent me to come hear from them, what is it they need? What do they need help with? Often they'll open up a little bit. Um, we The norms we, we live by are you have to be vulnerable. I can't help if you don't tell me um, what's really happening. The second is kind candor. Say anything you want, but say it nice. And then just last, uh, no judgment. It's a, a place of curiosity. I have no judgment. If you're a brand new teacher or you've been teaching for 20 years, I don't have any judgment. I'm not, leave, I'm not teaching your classes. So getting them to live by those basic community agreements first opens the door a little for it to be a little different than a top down. I don't go in with, here's my PowerPoint slide and I'm gonna teach you all these things. I sit down with them and really listen to their pain points. I must say over the last three years, lots of tears. I sit and hand out tissues to a lot of teachers, a lot of principals, a lot, just because they have to get it off their chest. They have to say what they need to say so that we can then move forward. But that trust piece, and then we have some rubrics that we use so they can self-evaluate where they think they are just as a, a, a starting point. But once I get them to trust and begin to share and try things, they begin to get excited about the possibility of the, the education world could be different. Hmm. I really like that idea of the the norms or, or agreements mm-hmm. that you come to. I want to push back a little bit because you listed mm-hmm. three of them. It sounds like those are your ideas. Is that not an example of like top down, mm-hmm. like you, you're coming with your quote unquote agenda here? Or are, is there some sort of conversation about what those agreements are? Yeah, yeah. So I normally tell them, here's a way to begin. We have to have some kind of community agreements. And, and sometimes they'll say, you know what we need to add to that? Do not we need people to be present? Everyone's on their telephone or grading papers, and they normally will come up with, because I'll tell them, what are we going to add to this list? We start with that every time. Every time we meet, we start back with, and so sometimes they'll make them different. They don't want, one of the groups didn't like the word vulnerability. They thought it felt too naked and raw. (laughs) So they wanted curiosity. They didn't want to have vulnerability. They just wanted, and so they make them. I just come up with, here's a way if you don't have one. And I normally start with, do you have some community agreements that you live by that you, as you meet as group, what I find is most don't. And what they don't understand is without those, there's no way to stop the runaway train. So Seth and I have been friends and teaching together for 20 years, but one day we disagree and it gets hot and heated. There's no way to stop that runaway train if you don't have some community agreements to say, whoa, wait, time out. And I've had to, like you said, I've had the teachers tell me who the F are you and why should I listen to you? (laughs) And I have to say, let's talk about some basic norms that we're going to agree to live by. You come up with them. I'll help you with some that work in places that I go, but you're right. It does have to come from them. And then we visit it every time they'll add some, it just can't be too many. It can't be a checklist. It's more, what are the three to five things we're going to agree to hold space for with each other? Yeah. I want to talk about that runaway train for a second, Mm -hmm. right? Because you can have agreements and then inevitably you get to a point where people fall out of alignment. They fall out of agreement. Is it your role to bring people back into alignment? Do you empower the rest of the group to bring each other back to it? Like, how does that evolve? Once I, once we all agree to them, then I tell them, okay, that means that anyone has the ability to call a pause if you're feeling uncomfortable, awkward, whatever it might be. It's normally me that does it the first time. I'm normally the one to say, whoa, and I don't call anyone out. I just say, time for, let, let's check ourselves. I don't say, hey, Seth, you're on your phone. I just tell them, everyone check yourself. And I just model it for them. So then they're funny because then they'll say to me, gosh, that was so easy. Why don't we do that more often? But we normally will call people out and nobody likes that. Kids don't like it. Adults don't like it. But I just will say, oh, you know what? Everyone check yourself. And then they'll, you'll watch everyone perk up for a minute. 
But the other thing is, it's very organic conversation. So there are often times that we have to put a pause, but unless we have those difficult conversations, how are we going to move forward? Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned a couple of words, uncomfortable and awkward. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if a certain degree of discomfort is necessary in order to get to some hard places. And I'm thinking about like the difference between a safe space and a brave space, right? Like it's impossible to truly create a safe space. And you're also trying to create something that is based on the feelings of others, which is by its nature impossible, as opposed to like more of a brave space where people are bringing a bit of courage despite their discomfort. Is that something, is that a dynamic that you speak to at all? Yeah. In the group, we often will have discussions around it to say, what can they do? Or even just basic sentence starters like you do for mm -hmm. kids. They sometimes just need a, what's the, here are three sentence starters if you're feeling like this. But I do find that in the school dynamic, most teachers are pretty, pretty close to each other. Most are, it's just when I get to sometimes like a, a department and I'll ask them, okay, I, and I'll call it out. I call it, okay, I feel something strange. I feel, are you, am I the only one feeling this? It feels like there's something awkward. And then they'll tell me. Seth once though got into a heated argument five years ago and we've never gotten over it. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. I said, so do we need to unpack that? Do we need to take a pause? Because now you're on the hot seat to talk about whatever happened five years ago, but you can see how, because they haven't lived it, I call it the, they've let craziness happen for so long mm. that it's become normal. And yeah, it takes yeah. someone from the outside to come in and say, okay, friends, this is not normal. This is not, this doesn't feel comfortable. So how do we move past this? And there is, that's when tears come. That's when apologies happen. That's when I didn't know you still felt that way. And I often talk about them, about these difficult things for the need of the new teachers. Mm. You all are okay with, Seth's behavior, what, how he acts, but watch the new teachers, watch them crawl up into a little hole, watch their light begin to extinguish because he's a little abrasive. He's a little bossy. He doesn't let anyone finish their sentences. And I just tell them, watch everyone in the room because our goal is to make sure everyone's voice is heard. And that isn't happening currently. You have some that are dominating, some that aren't letting others talk. You have people in tears. So you do have to talk about those things, but what the beauty is, and I don't enjoy those, like, but we have to get through it. Once we get past that and I can really get them into agreement and trying things differently, it's like new people, like people that I've worked with for three years. It's like a totally different person is arriving at those meetings because now they feel safe. They feel trusted. They feel that they can talk about things and that nothing's going to happen, but it definitely is difficult. Is this professional development for cycles of continuous improvement or is this group therapy? Because it sounds like a combination between the two. <laughs> right. Because to get to the continuous improvement, we have to do clarity of focus and shared leadership. Right. Oh, we have so to have, have to those actually understand what you want, which is Yeah. <laughs> so and our and the team's gonna course. do it, right? Who yes. And then we can dig in, but the, you have to start there where a lot of places, schools included, start with here's the strategy, here's the curriculum we just purchased. They start with that. You, you can't start there. You have to start with building that foundation because otherwise no sustainability. Yeah. It won't be sustainable, whatever you do. And so essentially your model accommodates any pedagogy, any content, just whatever it is that any given school values and wants to improve at, you come in, you help them do that. Yep. Yep. Exactly awesome. right. So they, the district's role is to pick the three or four big rocks tell me what are the three or four big things you want to move. And then I get to go to the school site and meet with the leadership teams to say, okay, based on these rocks, what are the problems of practice? What does the data say? What do you want to work on? So don't, it's not normally a free for all. It's but based on those rocks. You can pretty much pick anything that will fit under their LCAP goals. Um, and then from there, they then choose what do they want to try for the next four to six weeks? Um, what do you want to do? What evidence you want to bring back? And then that's where we delve into the continuous improvement cycle and trying something different. Got it. So the agenda is so, at least somewhat set by the district, which is important. I imagine they're the ones who have hired you. So, so they should <laughs> feel like their interests are being met. They Then you go to the schools, you get their input about what the 
real problem is maybe within those those general themes and you begin the cycle of continuous improvement by creating goals collecting data observing to see how it went coming revisiting the goals and doing that for four to six weeks is that how long your engagements are they're four to six weeks and then you're out no, for the school site. So then oh. every six to eight weeks, I meet with the school itself to say, okay, math department, English department, ninth grade algebra, whatever, however they do their PLCs, we then meet with the SLT to say, what feedback did we get? Because now that they've all tried it, somehow we have to collect from them. I'm not, a, accountability is not one of my favorite words. I'd rather it more be commitments like that they're agreeing to do because accountability breeds compliance. And I don't want that. I want them to be committed. I want this to last and be sustainable far after I'm gone. But that requires us to say, okay, and how are we going to collect from the teams? How did it go? And they come up with some way. A lot of times it's something like a Google slide, one Google slide per PLC group that says, here's what we worked on. Here's how it went. Here's the evidence we have. And here's what we need support with. Then the SLT team collects all of those to find the themes and trends. Oh, lots of people are working on this, or they need support with this, or which coach can go and help with whatever they're having trouble. The next level is I take all of those from all the school sites and take them to the district for a district leadership team to say, here's all the themes and trends. Here's what each school's working on. Here's where they're struggling. Here's where they need support. We have a learning round next week. Let's walk through classrooms and see if we're seeing implementation and what your next step might be for PD support based on what we see and what we've collected from all the schools over this eight week period. And at that point, like you talked about sustainability, right? Mm -hmm. But these are, when you talk about change at a school, that could be years long. So how are you maximizing your impact in a way that makes the change that you are encouraging uh, a sustainable change? Mm. We call it lead from the middle. So when I'm at the school sites, this is the really the teachers are the ones at the school site. There's normally the principal, the coaches, and then teachers. But once I get them understanding the process, they will do it even if the principal leaves, even after I leave, because they see that what they're doing is making a difference. They see that they're having impact. And that's my goal is in the three to five years, I don't commit to anything. I tell them I don't speed date. I want a ring. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> three to five years it's going to take for us to get this big ball rolling, right? All this didn't happen overnight. So it's going to take us a while. Um, but usually in three to five years, it's sustainable enough from the teacher level to the district level that then they can continue um, doing it on their own. We talk a lot about change in education on this podcast. And so the work that you're doing is very near to the heart of the purpose of what we do here. In our conversations, you also dropped a term that I just thought was fantastic. And it, you called it co-collaborating, which is what, teacher, what <laughs> teachers do when they try to collaborate, but they end up just talking to each other, which I think any teacher listening to this can instantly understand that, that term. Teacher happy hours come to mind of, of just sitting around and there is a camaraderie in that, right? There is a mm -hmm. off of steam. Obviously, it is an incredibly pressure it's a pressure cooker type of a position you are always on you are on all day every day and so at the end of a school week yeah it makes sense that you would want to go with your teacher buddies and honestly basically talk about kids right you talk you talk about the kids and and the principal for 2 hours over drinks at happy hour but but obviously that's not what you're trying to do in the context of a personal learning community or a an ongoing cycle of continuous improvement professional development session so how do you transition people from that co-collaborating to mm -hmm. collaborating I'd say it happens a little bit along the way where it's shared leadership, right? Clarity, focus, and shared leadership. They've got a little more buy-in, but the way we actually move it from collaborating to true collaboration is they have to make an agreement at the end. At the end, we can all talk about what we've tried, what research says on what works clearinghouse, what Hattie's work says. We can all talk about that opinion, but my goal is to push them into action. My goal is to, okay, and what are we going to do about it? What are we going to try? And it doesn't go down as an agreement unless we all agree. If I say, no, I don't want to do that, 
then we have to come up with another agreement. But that's the goal is to get them to try something in common so they can come back and talk about, did it work? Did it not work? Why did it work for you? Because everything you see out there has a compliant level and a research-based effective level. We often try things at the compliant level. I did it because I went to a PD and someone told me to do this. I put my objective on the board. (laughs) The kids have no idea what we're doing, but the objective's up there. (laughs) Instead, I try and give them some of the brain facts and the why behind research and what it says. And then we talk about what do student success indicators look like for whatever it is we're going to try. And what are we going to bring back as evidence? Once I get them to see that, they're now backwards mapping. They now know what the end goal is. A lot of assessment is not aligned to what they're teaching. They're not really looking at evidence of learning at the end of the day. They're looking at what do the kids know from the sofa? They're giving a diagnostic or they're giving some kind of mandated assessment and they, for a better word, poo that data because they'll say, I haven't taught that yet. What I want to see is, did what we tried have impact? And how are we going to know? I don't want your opinion. I don't want to know that you like this and it was great. I want to know, was it impactful for kids? Did more kids participate? Did more kids turn in the assignment? Whatever our problem of practice is, we want to have a direct evidence of learning correlation so that they can actually celebrate and see, yes, it had impact. Simple example, continuation school. I hate that word. Continuation school, you know who's there. The kids that didn't do well in comprehensive high school, they weren't doing good at credit recovery. They weren't finishing, getting their work done. So this group, what they wanted to do is move it from sixth period to first period. Will changing the time of day that we do it make kids finish complete more of their credits? We also tweaked the design. I said, what if we made it a mentor program? rather than uh, you just sit and I watch you do your credit recovery. So they started meeting with the kids one at a time to say, what are they working on? What do they need help with? They felt like it was going good after four to six weeks. They were meeting once a week with the administration to say who's doing, who's struggling. So it was a little proactive to know who was already having trouble. When we looked at the data, 70% increase in the assignments turned in, 10% decrease in discipline that went to the office. 15% decrease in tardies. And they were over the moon ecstatic. But without looking at numbers, you don't have anything to celebrate. I know they make people feel naked and afraid, right? (laughs) But if you don't look at something and say, is this working? Then you're just functioning on everyone's opinion. And that's a frustrating place. Instead, did it work? And what it did is they said they were so excited. They're like, oh my gosh. And I would give this caveat as well. Anything we agree on has to be high yield, low prep. Mm -hmm. It can't be something that requires us to do something extreme, cut out 5,000 circles tonight for the activity tomorrow. No, we're not doing that. But if it's high yield, low prep that we can all implement tomorrow, which changing that class ended up not being a big deal and just doing a mentorship instead of accountability, finish your credits. They were having better relationships with the kids. What a surprise. They got to know the kids better and what their struggles were, how to support them better. Um, And so the whole, we lifted everyone. And so that got the momentum going for the next cycle. Now, what are we going to do next time? How are we going to make this better? Yeah, that high yield, low prep thing, I think of that as like an effort impact matrix, right? Mm -hmm. You want to find that sweet spot of like low effort, high impact. And you've kind of been dancing around this idea of student success indicators, right? Like you Mm -hmm. you talked about a couple of things that you measured in the example of the continuation school. But I'm wondering, like, how do you get at those student success indicators? Because I imagine the district has one set of things that they want to be looking at. The principal might have another. The teachers might have another and the students might have another beyond that. Right. So like, how do you, how is, how do you conduct that conversation? Mm, So once they figured out, that's the next thing we do. Once they figure out what they want to work on another problem of practice, we start discussing in detail, what would success look like? Cause we have to calibrate that because success to you is different than me. That's where we run into the, the, the problem is all of a sudden I've got the teachers all on board. They're all agreeing. They all have their success indicators as a school. And then the district says, here's the walkthrough tool that we're going to use to walk through your classes. And I'm like, well, that's where I come in. Whoa, that this is what they've agreed to. And normally whatever they've agreed to is normally somewhere on the walkthrough tool. Hmm. And I'll say, okay, 
let's take a look at what they have. And so that might be a place to start. They're like, no, we have a walkthrough tool already. Okay, let's calibrate. Let's take a look at it. Is this really what it would look like? And it's really student focused. What are the kids doing? We've got to get away from the teachers doing all the dancing. I want to see what are the kids doing. And so we'll go through those and brainstorm. And then it's a continuous improvement, right? So then we'll four to six weeks, look at it, and they'll say, you know what, we need to add this to the student success indicators, or we need to put the kids need to collaborative conversations that every kid didn't get a turn to talk. We need to add that as a success indicator. So they begin to develop it on their own. I sometimes will give them resources from like what works clearinghouse or research so that they can know what are those high yield things that they can try but then they develop the success indicators. And I think that's an important part. It's almost like having students be part of the rubrics you're developing. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you? Why would you yeah. push down success indicators and say, here's what we're looking for? Then there's no buy-in. At least if they've developed them, they are then clear of, it's that part of building collective expertise. They're now clear of what it looks like at an effective level. Yeah. It's funny because I feel like so many of the questions that I've asked you here today the answer has been some variation on, you have to just take a step back and think about it. <laughs> and I think in that way, you're the perfect guest for us here on Make It Mindful, right? Because we are all about taking that step back, taking the object, trying to really notice what's going on here. And your, the cycle of continuous improvement that you're working with at schools, like that is a mindful process, right? Mm -hmm. in, involving all stakeholders, that is a mindful process. Like you're asking yourself, who is impacted by this and how are they going to be impacted? And how can we measure that? And it's all just, it's at your fingertips. All this stuff is at your fingertips. You just need to take the time to take a step back and think about what you should really be noticing here, right? So I thank you so much for your time and describing all of this work that you do. It's fantastic. I would like to know for our listeners, where can we find your work on the internet? What would you, where would you like to send people? Oh, so LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn. So follow me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. I share often the what's going on where are we at how are teachers doing so yeah i would love that and thank you so much so i have one question for you in Ooh. all the talk we had what's your mvp your most valuable point what's the one thing that we talked about that you're like oh this is the one thing that's stuck in my head oh my gosh putting me on the spot to know i love it <laughs> um no one's ever done this this is episode 30 <laughs> i think this is the first question i've been asked the first thing that comes to my head is co-collaborating just because it's, it's so visceral. I just remember it so, so much. <laughs> and, but I think that I, there may be a, a bit of a recency effect here, but we've talked a lot about the different roles and what they bring to the mm. process. And I think that there's something really important about engaging all levels of stakeholders mm. when you're going through change. And it's something that people forget about a lot, right? They try to like, yo, the district wants this, let's push it down this way. The process of bringing everyone together is messy, <laughs> right? And difficult and uncomfortable, but it is it is the way to get sustainable change, right? Like you have to have that democratic process, that structured but democratic process of getting buy-in at all levels in order to create sustainable change. Easier said than done, but that really resonates with me. And thank you. Oh, this. good one. Yeah. Yeah. And you see a lot of placebo meetings where they're calling people together, but then the decisions that happen after the fact have nothing to do with, that's a big frustration right now is I'm on all these committees now, but we leave and nothing we put in place or none of the decisions that we made ended up coming forth. And so then I, that's where I come in. Okay, here's the theme and trend I hear. You're having these <laughs> meetings, but no one's listening. So what are we going to do differently? So yeah, oh, I get man. to be the conduit. <laughs> that uh, reminds me of a story. I was working with a school overseas and I was coaching the local administration and how to work with American teachers. And I was like, you really want to give them an opportunity to share their opinion and share their perspective. And, sh and the administrator was like, okay, I can do that. And so she goes in and she conducts a meeting where she listens to them for half an hour. And then she just does what she was going to do in the first place. And I was like, no, that's not, uh, uh, okay. Let me clarify. If you've already made the decision, then maybe just make, just deliver the decision. But uh, let me, just, let me talk yeah. about democracy but it's messy right and there and as a leader you want to give people the ability to voice their concern 
and voice their opinion. And, but like you're, it is rare that you're going to get a hundred percent consensus from everybody. So at some point decisions need to be made. And then it's a matter of, I, I for me, it's okay. You need to, at very least, talk to people about the decision that you made and, and the information that you took from them. And if you did not adopt it, why you did not adopt it, I think that's a good way of like making people feel heard. And if they are, if it's an open and transparent kind of community, then they'll understand that maybe this time their opinion wasn't acted upon, but like next time it might be. And so there's that level of, of accountability there. But otherwise, it's it's tricky, right? It's tricky to be able to balance all of those needs at the same time time. It takes a long time. It takes a sustained effort. It takes a vulnerability. It takes clear mm -hmm. communication. It takes the understanding of what you actually want and need, which is not often what you say you want and need. <laughs> <laughs> or sometimes uh, you don't know. They're asking, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. and I call that what you just described. I call it, you have to go slow to go fast. Hmm. You have to go slow and you really have to listen in order to build that momentum. And oftentimes we just want to go fast. Let me just tell you what we decided. Here's what we're going to do. But that's why we're in the predicament we're in. We need to sit back and listen closely and then hear what they have to say. And then it's okay. We're all, and, and sometimes they get excited. Now you're going to let them do what for four to six weeks? Are you out of your mind? I said, it's four to six weeks. It's not all year. For four to six weeks, they're going to try this on for size. And, and they'll know in two weeks it's not going to work or it will work. They'll adjust. That's the whole point. And that's the go slow to go fast. So it's hard. It's difficult. And I realize it, but it's the only way that creates that sustainable change. Oh man, you've got all these little sound bites. I love it. Go slow to go fast. <laughs> Maybe that's the title of the podcast. I love it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you as always to our editor, Lucas Salazar. For our listeners, if you'd like to support us, please do tell a friend or follow us or leave a rating or a review. And everyone remember that if we are to bring positive change to education, we must first make it mindful. See you next time.